thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this information. Uh, there's been a lot of really big updates in the headache world over the past couple of years. And I think sometimes there's a big delay in it trickling down and getting the word out. So thank you for the platform. Um, so before we get started, I just have to give a couple of disclosures. Um, you know, my headache fellowship was funded through the Canadian Headache Society by a grant uh, through industry. Um, and as well, I take part in a lot of different types of advisory boards. Um, so we often review the data for new therapeutics that are coming out and give our thoughts and, and impressions on it or, or how they might be used differently. Um, and I often give a lot of talks kind of like this, different settings, sometimes to NPs, GPs, pharmacists. Um, I try to tailor it, you know, in different settings so that we can get everybody on board with migraine. Um, you know, I don't own any equity or anything in these companies, of course. Um, for today, for the acute talk, what I want to focus on, you know, I think any good talk about migraine has to begin with the diagnosis. So Justin, I'm very thankful we started with that tool. Um, you know, I think maybe a lot of people think they know what migraine is. They kind of take, you know, the Supreme Court justice approach to pornography. You know, I know it when I see it, but like, well, I don't know. I think that approach doesn't really work. And you kind of have to use firm criteria to make sure that you're not missing some other secondary cause of headache. Um, and then going over the options, you know, maybe NSAIDs and tryptans are our standards that we've used for many years. Uh, but there are some newer versions of these that you might not be familiar with uh, quite yet. And they tend to work a little bit better. So it may, may be another opportunity for some additional gain. There's a new kit on the block, which isn't quite here in Canada yet, uh, but it has been out in the States for a while. And we are poised at any time. Uh, actually, maybe Justin can tell you more about it at the booth. Uh, but these are the GPANs, and it's a new type of CGRP medication that's not used for prevention, uh, although some of them can be, but it can also be used as an abortive. Um, so we'll go over the mechanism of how it works and how, how, uh, how good it does its job. So as a disclaimer, um, some of the data I'm going to show you are not actually approved by Health Canada. They may be FDA approved, uh, but we still don't have the final approval. So if we go over a drug that isn't quite ready for Canadian prime time, I'm going to show you a little icon at the bottom of the slide that shows you to take a pause. So starting with the formal criteria for migraine, this is migraine without aura and need to have at least five headaches. They have to last somewhere between four hours and three days. Um, and it's kind of like a buffet. You don't need to fit all of these things. You know, it looks a lot like the DSM in that, um, you know, you have to fill each of these letter points, but, you know, you don't need all of the points within each category. So the classic migraine is one-sided, throbbing or pulsing, and it's typically moderate to severe. Um, people, you know, tend to say, you know, either I avoid physical activity or, or physical activity will make it worse, and taking a nap or resting, laying down tends to make it better. During the headache, the classic migraine, you know, is probably best characterized by light and sound sensitivity, uh, as well as nausea. Uh, not everybody vomits, and you don't need to necessarily vomit to fill the criteria, um, but it's an important part of it. The other thing, which is kind of a frustrating, <laughs> vexatious thing for neurologists, is E, and I would say not better accounted for by another diagnosis. And it's a good thing to go through that snoop mnemonic and, you know, do your physical exam. If you're worried, get an MRI. Um, but truly, it's almost impossible to truly rule out every possible secondary cause of headache. Chronic migraine, just in quick contrast, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, a bunch of the elder neurons got in a dark room together and they decided that 15 days was the cutoff. And if you have fewer than that, you're episodic. And if you have more than that, you're chronic migraine. And I think that made sense, you know, in terms of designing research trials and things, but clinically the disability we see from the high frequency episodic people is usually just as bad as, as some of the chronic migraineurs. Um, and, you know, maybe physiologically that doesn't always make 100% rational sense. You know, for me, a more important distinction is those people who have discrete episodes of multiple headache days with, you know, periods of quiescence in between and the 24 seven, 30 days a month kind of person. And, and maybe that's more important. Um, so those definitions are evolving now as we gain a bit better understanding. Uh, but just to, to remind you of the diagnosis criteria as they stand. So my tip, I actually have an even pared down version <laughs> compared to Justin's. Um, you know, if you want to make it even quicker and dirtier, you only need three points to really diagnose a migraine. And my sensitivity and specificity aren't as good with this. But if they say at, yes to at least two of these, then they probably have a migraine. Did light bother you when you had a headache? A lot more than when you don't have a headache. In the last three months, did it limit your ability to work, study, or do what you want to do, family activities, shopping, anything? And nausea, did you feel sick to your stomach? And if you said yes, the sensitivity is, you know, just over 80%, and the specificity is 75%. Uh, 
So, you know, maybe not as good, but if you only have, you know, five minutes to take a quick history and you're working in tiny intervals, this might be a useful tool for you in the clinic. So, uh, so I think it, it could be useful. Justin alluded to those red flags and uh, Dr. Dodek, one of our headache luminaries, you know, talked about uh, this in his uh, paper on it, SNOOP. So, you know, systemic signs. Do they have, you know, signs of rheumatism or another autoimmune or inflammatory condition? Systemic infections, malignancy, um, any kind of neuro sign or symptom, which can be vague because migraine comes along with things like brain fog and vertigo. Uh, so it's, it's looking more specifically for things like, you know, I have a fixed sensory motor deficit or I'm going like blind in one eye for periods at a time. Crescendo like thunderclap, and this can be kind of difficult. It really takes a careful history because a lot of patients feel their headaches are severe and come on quickly, but it really means like within a split second, bam, it hits you like lightning and it's the worst headache you've ever had. Um, older age of onset, you know, anybody over 50 who's coming to me and they say it's a new headache and you dig deeper and you say, well, are you sure you never had them earlier in life or as a kid? Um, and they're clear about it. You know, that's kind of a strange presentation. That's not usually migraine. And so just by rote, even, I would order ESR and CRP on these individuals just to screen for giant cell arteritis, um, because the classic criteria we use are probably missing a lot of cases of that. And then, you know, are there changes in the pattern? Is the phenotype stable over time, or is it progressing into something weird? Does it make them concerned? I mean, that's the biggest red flag if the patient is very worried. Um, and can it be provoked by certain manipulations, turning their head a certain way? Uh, you know, you can tell them not to do that, but that's not a good solution. Um, and postural. As we study headache more and more, looking for these things, I mean, the list just keeps expanding more and more and more. So it gets a little bit more complicated and sometimes you'll have to fight with the radiologist. But I would say if you do have these features, um, you know, in your history, and I ask them routinely on everybody, I think it's reasonable to do a comprehensive neuro screening exam and consider an MRI with, you know, possibly gadolinium or venography, depending on the presentation. So just to, to show you the slide, it's, it's a good summary. Um, I want to stress that migraine is more than just a headache, you know, so it, it, we all know that there is often an aura form that comes with migraine and proceeds it by, you know, five minutes up to an hour, but there's a postdrome and a prodrome. And, you know, like my favorite patient, I think he got bounced around from a bunch of doctors that thought he was just kind of neurotic or anxious. And he's a systems engineer, a general dynamic. And he had a spreadsheet with 127 symptoms that would occur in the week leading up to his migraines. And, uh, you know, I, some of them look kind of laughable, like, you know, I yawn three times in a row and I pee two times right before the migraine starts. And then you start to dig deeper and you're like, oh, these are all brainstem and spinal cord connections, you know, like it actually is documented. And he's just very, you know, in tune with his body and internal sensations. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from these patients instead of just minimizing it. So, you know, I tell people, watch out for things like the brain fog, vertigo, neck stiffness, all these kind of things. I mean, it's easy to minimize them and sweep them under the rug, but I think validating them and telling people that, yeah, they're a part of your migraine. And, you know, through the MRI in your exam, we've ruled out scarier causes. It provides a lot of reassurance. Another thing I hear a lot of times is like, I'll get a lot of referrals from people that just say headache, question mark. And you're like, okay. Uh, and I know people are busy and they're, they're struggling, but uh, I think to just give an idea of the prevalence of this problem, like some estimates suggest that it's 15 to 20 percent of Canadian population will be affected uh, by headache, uh, migraine specifically at some point in their life. And, you know, of those who have it, very few actually reach a formal diagnosis. And then you consider that there's like 1,080 practicing neurologists and like over a third of them are over 60. You know, if you do the math, it's impossible. I, I would say even fewer of those neurologists have an interest in headache specifically. Uh, so I think it's important that we kind of take an interdisciplinary approach. And there's so many points of contact where we have the chance to diagnose migraine and get them on the right path and make sure that they're enjoying more days of their life, you know. Uh, so that involves neurologists, GPs, NPs, physician assistants, psychiatrists, psychology, ENT, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, especially. I can't believe I left that out. Um, but I think it's a team effort and, and bringing it to attention, telling patients that there are options. You know, I have so many patients that came to me and they said, I wish I had met you 10 years earlier. Uh, because I never even knew that these were migraines and I had medicine for it. So back to the clinic, what can we offer them once we get to that point? Acute medications, you know, sometimes we're in a rush and we want to get them on the right preventive and we jump to that immediately. And the acute stuff sometimes falls under the, the wayside and, you know, we just kind of rely on like T3s over the counter or something. 
The mainstay are the NSAIDs and the tryptans. And of the NSAIDs, my favorites I've listed here, I use Cambia quite frequently and we'll go over the data for that briefly. Uh, naproxen is a tried and true, you know, it's very cheap and old and wonderful. And for the people that talk about gastric sensitivity, uh, one little secret of mine is nebumatone, which I picked up from Christine Lay over at Women's College. It's got a slower onset of action and it's a lot milder on the stomach. So I tell patients, you know, try this one just a couple of times and see if you're better able to tolerate it. And many of them can. Um, so, you know, I would, I would say keep nebumatone in your pocket for those people that say they really get dyspepsia. Uh, cambia, I like for its onset of action. When it comes to tryptans, um, there's a bunch, there's a rainbow, you know, maybe seven or so. And they all have slightly different pharmacokinetics, you know, when they peak and, and how long they stick around. Um, and there really is no right answer. You know, a lot of people have voodoo about how they select them. But I would say start in the middle with something like, you know, rizotriptan or elotriptan. And then if they're not strong enough, you go up to things like Suvex or com combining NSAIDs with tryptans. And if they're, you know, having a lot of side effects, I tend to move towards something like Almo or Nara tryptan, which we often use in pediatrics. And you can kind of use a bit of uh, a gentle persuasion to tell them that, you know, this is very tolerable in young children. Um, the other secret is combining them. And sometimes putting a tryptan with the NSAID is, you know, a little bit of synergy there. So the gestalt effect of it is that one plus one equals three kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the trouble there is that even when you tell patients and they understand it, they're hesitant to combine it because all of us want to take as little medicine as possible. You know, no one wants to overdose. Um, but it is very safe and very effective to combine it. And that's where, you know, formulated pills that combine both agents are, are kind of a useful trick there. So. What guidance do we have in Canada about acute medications? Uh, we have the, uh, from the CNSF, we have the Canadian Headache Society guidelines for acute use. And I highlighted here uh, some of my favorites from tryptan and, and uh, NSAID class. Now, tryptans, it's important to remember there are contraindications. Uh, you, you do have to quickly go over their history and make sure that they don't have any kind of ominous vascular disease. I avoid them in anybody with a history of stroke, TIA, heart attack, angina, really bad peripheral vascular disease of any kind. Raynaud's phenomenon, and you know, a lot of people get cold or turn pale in the cold, but I actually show them the pictures of Raynaud's and then you can kind of weed out who actually has it. Um, if there's any confusion, you can have a quick rheumatology opinion. Um, and then it comes to the pregnancy population. And I've seen a lot of women who struggle because they're told right away that, you know, oh, your Botox and your triptans aren't allowed during pregnancy, you have to stop them immediately. And that's not entirely true. Uh, you know, so we're, we're never going to be able to do prospective trials, obviously, but registry data is accumulating. And I would say things like sumatriptan, although they're still considered category C, they have a lot of empiric evidence that they're safe uh, for use in pregnancy. And so I will often prescribe them. And same with Botox, it can be used off-label during pregnancy. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable administering it, you know, uh, just send them over to your uh, friendly headache specialist and help you out. So try a trip then, you know, some people have a bit of cold feet with it, but your patient will thank you. Um, and you may need to try more than one, you know, even though the chemistries are similar, sometimes people bounce around between two or three before they decide on one that they like. The other trick is nipping it early in the bud. And you gotta be careful about how you tell patients about this. The sooner you intervene, like say dur during aura phase or something, the more likely you are to abort the headache. Um, however, I think sometimes patients get confused and they say, well, I was told if the headache already started, then it's no use taking it. Um, and that's not true. So uh, just to be clear in the way that we educate people about it. Um, we talked about combining it. And I always remind my patients about the overuse. So, you know, in contrast to your preventives, these are not the ones that you want to be taking every day. So simple analgesics, Tylenol, Advil, naproxen, they have to be used under 15 days per month. And the more complicated ones, like, you know, triptans, Excedrin, your combo pills, or anything with codeine, those really should be fewer than 10 or even six days per month. And it's not like you can do 10 of one and 15 of another for 25. There's a lot of overlap there. So really no more than 15 days total in a month. Opioids in my practice, I don't use them at all, except for maybe the most refractory headaches or people who truly are in the midst of like palliation for brain tumors and things. Um, I, I really find that they do cause a lot of rebound and more trouble than, than uh, help. Uh, so I really tend to avoid them altogether for headaches. If you are taking their Advil away and you, know, you uncover that they're actually taking it around the clock, 25 days a month, I always try to give them something in return. Like I think there are some places like in Denmark and such 
where they take a very hard paternalistic approach and they say, get out of my clinic and don't come back for four months until you've cleared yourself of everything. And then tell me if you want the medicine. And their argument is that, well, in a big chunk of them, you know, a lot of them improve spontaneously. They don't need any medicine. Uh, but I think you're still torturing some of those poor migrants who had to wait another four months. So I will tell people about the limits. And then on the other hand, if you're taking something with one hand, you give them a preventive and you try to mask it. And I think it's a bit of a gentler approach that, that builds more of a therapeutic relationship. So on to Cambia. So this is that clofenac powder. And the reason I like it, uh, I actually use it for my own headaches, is because of the onset of action. Um, so it's a tiny little sachet, you rip it, toss it into two ounces of water and it fizzes up. It unfortunately has a bit of a used mouthwash flavor, so it's not everybody's favorite. It tastes like mint and uh, anise, um, but the flavor is worth it because it, it is very effective. And so just to show you, uh, you know, a typical diclofenac tablet, as opposed to the Cambia preparation, it will peak in the serum around one hour, whereas Cambia peaks at about 15 minutes. Um, and so it's great for people who are waking up with a migraine, have a very fast acting onset, um, you know, or they just want to get immediate relief. So measurable plasma levels within five minutes, peak is at 15, and food doesn't impact it the same way that you might with a slower release tablet. Um, just quick profile comparison with ibuprofen and naproxen, you can see it's a lot faster. So that's why I, I prefer this one. If you're looking at it versus triptans, I mean, Subcutaneous sumatriptan is a good immediate vehicle, but it's very hard to convince patients to administer needles to themselves that way. Um, and otherwise, the triptans, you know, depending on their estimates, range between 45 to 60 minutes for onset. So I would say fast rising attacks, attacks on waking, and also early nausea uh, can be a good way to tackle it. Uh, quickly, we'll just show you the trial data for Cambia. And this is a fairly straightforward trial, had about 800 people, and they took typical migraine with or without aura. And what they were looking for was pain freedom or freedom from nausea, light, or sound sensitivity. At two hours, uh, Cambia was at 25% as compared to 10% for placebo. And just to give you a rough rule of thumb, sumatriptan in a meta-analysis, uh, you know, about 29% of people are pain free at two hours. So fairly comparable. For nausea, light, and sound sensitivity, again, significant both clinically and statistically. Um, and so I have a lot of patients who had been kind of bumping around on naproxen or Excedrin for a long time and uh, switching them over to Cambia made a big difference. Safety profile, I mean, looking at this one, it's well tolerated. And to be honest, it's very similar to placebo. In real life, uh, probably what my patients complain most about with it is dyspepsia. They feel it's very harsh on the stomach um, and maybe a little bit of somnolence or wooziness, dizziness. Um, and that's not very common, uh, but it does happen enough that it seems related. My favorite one was I had a lady who told me her migraine elixir was she would mix, pour herself a bath and mix Cambia into a glass of red wine. Uh, and I told her never to do that because, I mean, number one, it ruins the chemistry of it. And uh, second of all, I think it's like rock if you will burn an ulcer through your stomach. So, uh, But she swore that it worked. Uh, I do not recommend that. So uh, CHS uh, treatment recommendations for Cambia early onset action and recommended as a first choice for you know, migraine attacks of all severities uh, and also ones that rise in intensity pretty quickly. Sometimes the NSAID isn't enough though. And uh, you know, we talked about combining the triptans and NSAIDs. Sumatriptan uh, with naproxen is combined in a single tablet called Suvex. And this is a little bit different from each agent alone because they formulated both uh, slightly differently. And uh, so again, it can be used for migraine with or without aura. You take one tablet as soon as you think the migraine is coming, and you're able to take a second one in that day. Uh, but you know it's important to tell your patients you're limited because you can't combine this with other tryptans or other NSAIDs that day. Um, so quickly looking at these pivotal trials, you can see there were uh, four arms here, placebo versus Suvex, the combo tab. And then they also looked at each individual component uh, separately. And so Suvex had, you know, I would say clinically and also statistically significant uh, gains across all arms. Side effects. Um, so looking at this, I would say maybe a little bit more dizziness and drowsiness uh, compared to any of the agents alone. But overall, there weren't really any significant uh, new safety concerns that weren't already identified with the individual components. So oh, combination superior to either medicine alone. Uh, early intervention results are improved at both two hours and also for sustained relief at a day. Um, and this one acts faster because of that formulation. So it may be absorbed at 30 minutes. So a little bit of a gain over traditional triptans. And it's, it's pretty reliable. 
And most of those individuals who had the good pain freedom at two hours, they stayed pain free at 24 hours and they didn't need additional medicine. Um, so that's important. And I think what's neat about it is even though you try to build that therapeutic relationship, you try to convince them to combine the pills, most patients won't combine the separate ones. Um, and so this enhances the compliance or adherence rather um, to the combo therapy. Other things which we won't go deeper into today, but if you're interested, I gave a talk for Migraine Canada and it's available on YouTube. Um, there are neurostimulator devices. So I will often have patients, you know, who don't like those damn pills and uh, I will direct them over to these. And, you know, the issue here is the cost is a bit prohibitive. Uh, so maybe like a Cephaly can be 300 to $400 um, and you have to replace the pads every so often. Um, and then the Gamma Core is a bit of an investment upfront and then you have to pay for a monthly subscription of a couple hundred dollars. Um, so, so it can be pricey for some, but you know, for others, the gains are worth it and they get to avoid medicine. Um, the other ones, the Enera and Nerevio are not available in Canada right now, um, but who knows maybe. So somewhere in the bowels of hell, there is a poor uh, intern at the pharmaceutical company who's casting Scrabble tiles and naming drugs. And I think uh, I, that's how they named this new one, the G-Pan. So I'm not entirely sure how they came up with this. Um, but this is a, a new big development in, in migraine. And the class as a whole is really changing the way we think about our medicines, because traditionally we have two arms. We have the acute, which is what you take when you need it, and the preventive, which you take every day. These drugs are kind of blurring the line between those because they can be used differently, both as an abortive or as a regular uh, medicine. So we'll get to that in a second. So what is a GPAN? It's a small molecule calcitonin gene related peptide uh, receptor antagonist. So it's, it's able to cross the blood brain barrier. It, it blocks the receptor that CGRP acts at, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, it's taken orally as opposed to some of the uh, monoclonal antibody injections you may have used. Um, and it blocks the binding of that molecule to the receptor. So the effects of CGRP uh, antagonism as it pertains to migraine include stopping neurogenic inflammation, it stops dilatation of arteries, which isn't necessarily a cause of pain, but it's an epiphenomenon that's related. It stops the transmission of pain. And uh, you know, it, it is relatively asymptomatic in terms of causing a lot of side effects. You know, maybe a little bit of constipation, but in general, um, it, it's a very useful mechanism to target. CGRP itself is a very large molecule. You can see this Kekulé diagram here, and it's a 37 amino acid neuropeptide. It is the most abundant one all throughout the dura, the casing of the brain, and the trigeminal ganglion, uh, which we think is, you know, the main uh, mechanism through which migraine exerts its pain. It's also located in uh, small nerve fiber endings that, that transmit pain. And it's co-released with glutamate when you activate trigeminal ganglion neurons. And so it does a bunch of different things. In addition to causing inflammation and, and reinforcing nerve signals, um, it changes the way we modulate pain, the perception of pain and sensitization. It also does a lot of weird stuff all around the body, promotes peristalsis, so that's where the constipation comes in. It's involved in wound healing and hormonal regulation, even placental implantation. Uh, but the good news is that blocking it, it's actually quite redundant in a lot of these uh, functions. So, you know, it's one of many uh, agents that are doing these things, so it doesn't seem to cause many side effects. So how did we get clued into this for migraine? Um, you know, it started back in the 80s. And uh, we started looking at certain serum and CSF studies, including CGRP levels. And it was increased in people during a migraine, and it dropped when you gave people sumatriptan. Um, you know, it increased during uh, the premonitory uh, phase of that headache before the aura starts even. Um, and you can see that, like, I don't know how they got REB to do this, but they would take healthy controls and infuse large amounts of CGRP and actually cause a migraine in people who had not experienced them before. Um, so, you know, it, they were able to demonstrate the causality. Um, and we were also able to see a difference in the concentrations in both serum and CSF uh, in chronic migraines as opposed to episodic migraines. So it seemed like there was a dose response. It could cause migraines, um, you know, a response to tryptans and drops off. It also was able to respond, uh, predict response to Botox. So putting it all together, I thought, well, what would happen if we blocked this? So back to the GPAN. Um, these are the three main ones that are poised to come to Canada. In um, and so we have Atojapant, Ubrojapant, and Remegipant. Uh, just to highlight again, these are not yet available in Canada or approved, uh, but have been being used in the States. And what's interesting, like I mentioned, is that they can be used either acutely or preventively. So Remegipant, uh, for instance, 
Um, you know, this one is for acute and preventive treatment. Uh, a Tojapan is for preventive and a brojapan is acute. So important to point out, they do not cause vasoconstriction. So they're not, they, they may promote, they may inhibit dilatation of vessels, um, but they don't actually cause them to constrict and move it. And there's no contraindications for use in patients with vascular disease. So that's in contrast with the trip downs like we talked about. Um, and throughout all of these trials, which were very large so that they could get good statistical uh, sensitivity, uh, you know, they did not encounter any significant cardiovascular uh, adverse effects. They're also thought not to contribute to medication overuse headache. And so that uh, really gives like a useful kind of tool for the patients who are stuck on these medicines, uh, like naproxen and T3s and things, and they're looking to transition to something safer. Um, I also like them as a potential option for the patients who are needle phobic. You know, like I have many who are like, oh God, I dread that one day I have to inject myself with a monoclonal antibody, even though it's really, it's a tiny little needle in an auto injector. It's still a big hurdle for them. And I think this might be, you know, a, a, a useful alternative for them. So when should we consider them for use? Uh, the American Headache Society, uh, they issued a consensus guideline. Um, and I would say that like the main criteria would be, uh, you know, if you're 18 or older, you have a confirmed migraine diagnosis and triptans or NSAIDs are either contraindicated uh, from vascular disease or, you know, gastric bypass or something, ineffective or not tolerated. Um, and I think that's a good rule of thumb. So for the sake of time today, uh, we're going to run through some of the data looking at these medications, but I don't have time to do a good deep dive on each trial independently. So I'm presenting the data in aggregate, but it's really for just kind of conversation purposes only. All these trials all differ a little bit in terms of their methodology and you know how they selected patients, how they define things. So a head-to-head -head comparison isn't exactly possible. Um, so you got You can't really look at the numbers side by side. We'll start with UbroJapant, and this is an acute treatment. You can take 50 or 100 milligrams as needed. And if you need to, uh, two hours later, you still have a headache, you can take a second dose. You really shouldn't be going over 200 milligrams a day. And in patients who have severe kidney or liver disease, they're saying, well, maybe it's more prudent to take a reduced dose of 50 milligrams. Remegepan, on the other hand, uh, this is an oral antagonist, excuse me, and it started off with a regular tab and then they re-released it with an oral disintegrating format. And it can be used both for prevention and acute, um, available in 75 milligram tablets. So if you're using it acutely, you can just take it as needed. Um, and really, you can only take it once in that 24 hour period. And if you're using it as a preventive, it's taken every other day. Okay. And uh, so sometimes you can top it up, like say you were taking it every other day and you still got a breakthrough migraine, you may be able to take an extra uh, rescue pill. So putting them all together in trial format, um, Rojapan was the pivotal trials for this one were achieved one and two. And they evaluated a couple of different doses from 25 milligrams up to 100. And the main uh, endpoints for all of these trials were two hour pain freedom. Uh, and so looking at the gain, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to interpret these values. Um, so I would say pretty good like pain freedom, but like most of our pain trials, placebo is, has got a huge response. Um, you know, and, and so pain is very subjective and it does play an important role. And I think the problem is patients will often interpret placebo as fake or, or even clinician that this, this response is somehow inferior, but it is an important part of treatment. Um, and I think it's important to consider it, but the issue is coming from more of a cost analysis. So if we're looking at the benefits of a placebo or even just natural history, um, you know, for me, my rule of thumb is looking at number needed to treat, and you have to be careful about how you calculate it. There's lots of corrections you can use, but using a quick and, and dirty, uh, you know, comparison of the percentages uh, with absolute risk reduction and the inverse, uh, the numbers needed to treat range like from nine to 13. And so rule of thumb generally, they say five is probably a cutoff, but I don't wanna like throw these drugs under the bus because I think they're very useful for certain populations like we mentioned, the refractory ones who have failed to respond to tryptans or enzymes or those who are contraindicated from using other drugs because we used to tell them, you know, maybe you could take aspirin or Tylenol and then good luck to you. Um, so I, st I think they still have a useful uh, role to play, but they may be limited by, by some of their... Uh, cost analysis. So back to Brojapan, it's well tolerated, side effects similar to placebo, and the most common side effects were probably nausea and dizziness, and there were some concerns about liver enzymes because back in the day, the very first manifestations of these drugs, 
did have some issues with hepatotoxicity. And so uh, many of the trials were, were uh, concerned with looking at uh, safety signals for this. But uh, with the Liver Safety Adjudication Board, none of the events that occurred were thought to be related to the drug itself. For remegipant, uh, the most common side effects, again, were actually dizziness, nausea, maybe a little bit of constipation. Like I mentioned, it can be used every other day with a top-up medication once in a while, but really you shouldn't be going over 18 doses in a 30-day period. Uh, until we have additional safety data, it probably is safe, but we're not entirely certain. Um, so the recommendation is to stop at 18. And you also have to be concerned maybe about some other medications. Uh, cytochrome uh, 3A4 you know, has some interaction there, and so you've got to be careful with things like uh, you know, different um, antifungal agents and certain breast cancer drugs and things like that. Um, so it's important to do those checks. So GPANs versus tryptans, how do they measure up? That's the main question everybody wants to know. And so there was a great uh, system review and meta-analysis in JAMA uh, that looked at this. And they looked at 64 different uh, RCTs. And uh, what they found was that the two-hour pain freedom, uh, tryptans were superior to GPANs. And for pain freedom or pain relief at two hours after the dose, lismidadan, which we're not going to talk about today, remegipant and ubrojipant were associated with higher odd ratio or um, compared with placebo, but lower compared with most tryptans. Um, so still superior to placebo. Uh, the comparisons between the newer agents really didn't reach any significance, so they're all pretty comparable. And I just want to highlight again that the lack of cardiovascular risks for these new classes may offer a good alternative to tryptans for those who are kind of in the cold range. The FDA in their clinical reviews also calculated some numbers needed to treat. Um, and so you can see for remegipant, perhaps 20, um, you know, for, for uh, that one. And most bothersome symptom, which could be nausea, photosensitivity, or light sensitivity, uh, 11. Uh, so still pretty good there, but the numbers are high. Um, and same for ibrojapan, somewhere around 10 people needed to be treated. Um, and so if we're looking at like a meta-analysis of tryptans, uh, just for a rough comparison, um, there was a great uh, study here by Adelman and, and Belzi, and they found that the tryptans range, you know, maybe frobotryptan is comparable to the GPANs around 11.3, uh, but the other tryptans seem to range between uh, three to eight or so in terms of numbers needed to treat. And like I mentioned, as a general rule of thumb for me, maybe number needed to treat of five or under uh, is generally considered to be like a good cost-effective acceptable intervention. So what are the costs of GPANs? Uh, you know, the cost depends on insurance coverage. We don't have Canadian prices sorted just yet, uh, but if we're looking to American prices, you know, a toe Japan, Kilipta, uh, 30 day supply can set you back about $1,000 American. Rumed Japan, uh, about 900 to 960, and Ubro Japan is $85 per dose. So as they come to market, because this is still under patent, it will be a significant barrier to many people who can't afford these medications. Um, but I will say that I've had excellent success and good encounters with the patient support programs. They're very helpful with getting uh, those people to the right venues of coverage in Ontario, be that like the Trillium program, we have different types of financial assistance. And if they can't always help with that, you know, there's often an opportunity for some compassionate supply. Um, so, so there are options. One paper that I really love, I mean, I, if you have ever read anything by Elizabeth Loder, she's excellent. Uh, Dr. Loder is over at Harvard, and she, she is the headache specialist, among many other things. Um, and she has a lot of really interesting arguments, and she likes to take kind of contrary positions to, to things at times. And she wrote an article about the GPANs, and she wanted to criticize maybe the way that the data were being presented, because I think oftentimes we focus too much on statistical significance. And so she wanted to hyphen that, you know, like the trials are very well designed, and they have many, many patients, which makes it easy to achieve statistical significance. Um, but it's important that we really reflect on how useful these are for our patients. And so again, she kind of highlighted the emphasis on that number needed to treat. Um, but I think in contrast to her opinion, like I mentioned, this is a useful tool for those who really have failed to respond to other things and uh, you know, who, who perhaps uh, may, may benefit because of contraindications. So in summary, NSAIDs and tryptans remain the mainstay of acute management of migraine. Cambia offers a faster acting NSAID option. So if you have a patient who's been stable on naproxen or something for a while, try switching them over and just see how they do. Suvex improves adherence in combining therapies, which can be a great strategy for those who aren't responding to NSAID or tryptan alone. And there's some synergy there. 
new migraine treatments have arrived to market, like the GPIMP, and more are likely on the way. And the small molecule antagonists are effective, safe, and well-tolerated. Great options for people with contraindications or failures to the traditional acute abortives. Um, you know, they seem to be very safe from a cardiovascular point of view. But questions remain regarding the cost effectiveness and, and access in our market. So I want to thank you for this. And we're going to take a brief pause before we transition on to uh, the preventive options. But any questions or anything? Um, we do have some questions. Um, would you like to take them right now, a few of them? Sure. That's fine. What, what time are we at? Yeah, we're at 11.35, so we have about 25 minutes until our formal Q&A. So yeah, we can take a few questions, no problem. Perfect. Okay, so there is just a fault. First of all, let me say thank you for your first presentation. It was a neat journey to see the faithful, the old faithfuls or the tried veterans, if we want to call them that, to seeing the new um, and especially the, the new ones that I still can't pronounce very well. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. And thank you for adding some humor to, you know, a very um, important um, topic. Um, I think you, you spoke um, and took us through the journey very well. So we have a question just as a follow up. Um, is there evidence to support Botox use in pregnancy? Um, in her area, um, this is one of the persons who asked the question, um, there's some hesitancy to use Botox for migraines in breastfeeding women, as well as pregnancy. So I'm curious if you can comment where the risk is much less than in pregnancy. Sorry, not comment on that. Let me clarify. She said, there's some hesitancy to use Botox for migraines in breastfeeding uh, women, as well as pregnancy, where the risk is much less than in pregnancy. So could you comment on that about the evidence? Yeah, yeah. I think like we do have registry tr data and you can talk to your friendly Abby rep of you and, and they'll redirect you to the MSL who can go over some of that with you. Um, there's also a lot of other headache experts. Like I have uh, friends in Montreal, Liz LaRue and Heather Pym, and they have large series of patients who are receiving these. I, I'm not concerned because a very small sub percentage amount of Botox actually enters the circulation. The vast majority of it stays where you inject it. You know, maybe it tracks back along nerves or through dural suture lines or something, but even that's kind of controversial. Um, I would say we have some interesting case reports that, for me, make suggest that it's safe. Like, there's a woman who got systemic botulism while pregnant, at the, like early in in her first trimester, and she's paralyzed in the ICU on a ventilator and everything, and carries the child to term in the ICU with systemic botulism, and the child was born perfectly fine without any issues. I know that's an N of one, but still it kind of suggests to me that even with large amounts of flooding the system with a botulinum toxin, that it's still probably very safe. Um, and then again, we do have these you know, instances where people are taking Botox injections and don't know that they're pregnant or they're taking it because they don't care anyway because the migraines are so bad. And so we have collected these data retrospectively and, and it seems very safe for me. I think the fraction excreted in the milk also is very, very small. So I'm not particularly concerned. I've never heard of any actual adverse um, so yeah, I think it would be good to get in touch with the MSL from Allergan. They're able to provide you with some of those data. No, thank you for that. And we've been talking about this for the last day and a half, and especially this morning about the whole person, about looking at um, where are their traditional beliefs coming from, where are their important uh, touch points. And so um, one question is quite, quite broad, but I think let's dive into it. It's really important to do someone who suffers from migraines chronically um, and maybe hears about these new medications, but is like, oh, hesitant. Um, or maybe they want to look at other aspects. Maybe they've heard about this or that. How can we breed and bring that hope to someone who's chronically experiencing migraines? It will take a radical restructuring of the neurology consultation. In my clinic, every patient gets a 90 minute consultation to start. And so we go through everything with a fine tooth comb and we go over all their lifestyle, psychiatric history, history of adverse childhood events and everything. We're going through this in such fine detail and trying to get them to resources like psychology, CBT. Um, so we, we also look at everything in lifestyle from caffeine intake to exercise, sleep habits, everything. And so we really have that opportunity in an hour and a half to dig down and identify those problems. If, I, if it's a very difficult consult, I don't have enough even in 90 minutes, I'll be referring them off to sleep psychiatry or other things like that, if you're lucky enough to have it in your area. Um, so making those connections with the other providers, it really does take a whole village for a lot of these migraineurs. Many of my patients come away and they're like, you know, I've seen three other doctors for migraine and they saw me for 15 minutes and they never talked about any of this. And 
I think it's important to do because I have some patients even that come back at follow up and they'll tell me, well, to be honest, I didn't trust you at first. And so I just wanted to try the lifestyle stuff first. You know, I added more morning protein. I'm drinking water throughout the day. I'm exercising and all my headaches are gone. So they were dehydrated and undernourished, you know, and so I think it's good to check those as well before you throw medicine at people. So that's why I often, for the hesitant, you know, I call them my aquarians. Uh, I have many people that bring their crystals to clinic and tell me, and I, you know, I, I don't try to be patronizing or anything. And I say, well, you know, try these things, try my lifestyle advice. Here's some nutraceuticals and vitamins, which have low grade evidence, but may be a useful complement. And if after that, after, you know, three to six months, you're still not happy, here is the list. You know, I have a brochure of all the medicines. I said, you can do some additional reading. These are the common side effects and everything. When you're ready to start that, I'm here to help you. Um, you know, so I try to get them on the right path and then they know what is available to them and it's still up to them. It's never a forced thing. Well, I think you're setting the stage for a 90 minute consult revamped. Wow, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> and, I, and I think this is gonna, gonna lend itself well to further conversations and, um, you know, hopefully, I know that's happening um, within our realm here in, in Western Canada too, but um, we want to keep pressing forward for changing things. And we talked about some positively disrupting aspects of our healthcare system. So thank you for sharing that. Um, shall we go on to your next presentation and we can take a few questions at the end? Yeah. So good. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Melanish. And, and you're going to be speaking about updates on migraine prevention. So thank you so much. 